so much for the kind invitation and that great welcome. It's great to see so many people so interested in the prehistory of Northeast England. Um, Paul's kind of done, covered my first slide for me, which is great. Um, I was just going to say that I came to uh, Newcastle in 2004, and a few years after that, I started looking at the early Bronze Age archaeology in the region. And I thought it was rather neglected, certainly at a national level. There was lots of work going on um, locally, and there was a good history of research, particularly quite a lot of the, the Bronze Age barrows had been um, reported by Greenwell in uh, the 19th century. There was a good tradition of research here, but there wasn't a single synthesis of the whole region, and it didn't feature very prominently in um, uh, sort of large scale national level uh, literature. Um, so I managed to draw together data from 355 burials from across 150 sites and um, worked with Michelle Gamble, who is an osteologist, and she was able to re-examine a lot of the human remains in the museum collections. And I was able to get money for a little bit of radiocarbon dating. And then subsequently to that, um, it's the remains have been of interest to um, David Reich at the um, Harvard Genetics um, Laboratory. And um, he's been using some of these remains in his analysis of ancient DNA, um, which is a very sort of large scale project. And I'll be talking about all of those in the course of the talk. What I want to do today is I want to, to talk in three parts, really. And the, the first part is going to be the longest. Um, part one is about change and variation in burial practices. Um, but I also want to think about what inferences we can draw about people's beliefs about life and death from these, and what we can say about identity in the period, which is closely related to belief. Now, the, the start of this period is, um, sorry, I'm messing with my screen here. The start of the period is distinguished from the Neolithic by the arrival of beaker pottery, <laughs> copper artifacts, and new burial practices from the near continent around 2500 to 2300 BC. But as you can see from the slide on the right, this is a patchwork picture. There are actually very few burials with early bell beaker pottery like the pot in this slide. <clears throat> um, and they're absent in most of the Western regions, including where other types of artifacts, copper halberds, like the one on the left here, have been found. Those are the areas in red. So this isn't something that happens in a unified way and, and in a sort of single uh, phase of activity across large areas of Britain. Um, there are probably multiple points of connection with communities around Britain and Ireland and the near continent um, in this period. I'm going to come back to that larger scale towards the end of the talk. But what I want to do now is just to focus on the northeast and draw out some of these chronological trends in burial practice. Now, last week, Andrew Fitzpatrick gave us an excellent talk about this fascinating um, early beaker burial at Kirkuf um, with its, its sort of complex assemblage of artifacts. I'm not going to talk about it um, um, because he already has, and I, I won't say any more other than that it really is quite exceptional um, for the region. And it's one of, of a very widely dispersed um, group of burials, um, which, which is spread very thinly across um, Britain and the near continent. Unlike the Kirk of burial, the vast majority of burials from this region um, were that have survived were placed in short kists. And you can see an image of, of, of a kist. Uh, this is a drawing of a kist um, from Bochester on the screen there. It's a stone lined short grave. Short kists are about one meter long on average. And this is quite a widespread practice throughout the region, um, predominantly oriented east-west, but we'll see that that can be, that can be quite varied. And um, they're in use for a long period of time um, as, as, a, as a group of, of um, as, a, as a type of burial feature, the earliest ones probably between um, 2300 and, and the latest ones probably around 1800 BC. Those with short necked beakers, or those with, with earlyish forms of beaker pottery, like the one on the slide here, 
were largely inhumations, that is burials that are placed in the grave as an, as, as, uh, as an unburnt set of remains. Only three with beak pottery in the region included uh, cremated remains. Um, now the kist itself is usually buried within a, um, a round pit and, and that's then backfilled around the edge of the feature and they're covered with a heavy stone slab. They're clearly designed to keep the body tightly contracted and lying flexed on one side. Now at the very large scale, um, across um, northern parts of Britain, we know that people were um, laid out according to a sexually differentiated pattern. And men were predominantly placed on their left and women were placed on their right. And this is something we see not just in Britain, but also, um, for instance, in uh, the Low Countries in, um, in, a, in, a, in a contemporary period. The, the position of the, of the body, whether the grave is aligned um, in a north-south position or an east-west position, that varies regionally. But the left-right positioning uh, seems to be quite a strong pattern at a large scale. And it's strong up to around 2150 BC, and then it changes. But the local picture in the Northeast, particularly in Northumberland, is a little bit more varied. Where we've got information to do this sort of analysis, about half of what I'm going to call isolated short kists, so ones that are just on their own or in pairs, about half of them are oriented east-west. And that rises to 60% if we consider all of those with beakers. But that's not as strong a pattern as we see in some other areas. So for instance, if we look just north of the border, as Neil Wilkin and I have done, in East Lothian, 90% of the burials have that east-west alignment. It's a much more rigid um, adherence to a particular practice, perhaps associated with a particular belief. Now, we don't have a lot of local data on sex and body position because we don't have lots of, um, of, of, of human remains that survive in very good condition. But the overall trend in the Northeast isn't as strong as we see in Eastern Yorkshire or Aberdeenshire. So it seems plausible that there might be greater diversity in practice here than in some of the other regions. And that might relate to a wider flexibility in beliefs about the importance of orienting the dead or less prescriptive ideas about gendered identity. At a national scale, greater diversity in burial orientation after around 2150 BC also coincides with the development of cemeteries and the spread of a new type of ceramic, food vessel pottery, which I'll, I'll show you an image of and talk a bit more about later, and a rise in cremating remains before placing them in the grave. Okay, I'm gonna stick with this early period for now though, um, that's between 2300 or so and 2100. There is some local diversity in how these short kists are used in this period and we can see that more strongly if we compare the northeast with neighbouring areas. So these burials are all from um, southeast Scotland, um, mainly Lothian, and what you can see here is um, dual burials. So we've got uh, this is the site on the left is Dryburn Bridge. Um, these are two separate burials, but each one has got a pair of individuals in it. And the one on the right um, is from Thurston Mains in uh, Edinburgh. And again, it's, it, that one's a, a single kiss, but you can see there are two individuals placed within it. And this seems to be something of, of a local, um, a local tradition. It, it's it's quite idiosyncratic in some ways. But it's, it's being um, practiced in kists that are, are otherwise very standard and part of this east-west orientation that's very strong in that region. So there is experimentation, there is local diversity. And, the, and as I say, the east-west pattern is much stronger in this region than it is um, in, North, in, North, in Northumberland. And it's important to set single burials alongside other diverse contemporary practices. The collective burial at Boscombe in Wiltshire on the left here reminds us that there were collective deposits beyond just uh, one or two individuals. And disarticulated remains have also been found with some very early beaker burials, such as the one on Sorisdale, at Sorisdale on Colt. 
cremated remains have been found from um, this period in a kist at Low Hawksley in Druridge Bay on the right here. I'm going to talk about this site later. But the point I want to make is that even during a period when body position was clearly patterned according to certain rules and ideas, there was a diversity in whether bodies were buried singly, intact and unburnt, or in a range of other ways. And it's also quite likely that not everybody was buried at all. The provision of grave goods for the dead also varied. Very few burials had more than one or two surviving artefacts, and some were not accompanied by any. So this site from Hollybush Field, um, it's, it's a tall man. Um, he would have walked with a limp um, because of a, a, this um, broken and infected uh, bone in his leg. Um, he's buried in a, in, in a slightly unusual position, you know, this northeast to southwest orientation um, on his left side. But the point is that the, there are no um, artifacts in this grave. We only know that it, it dates from this period because of the similarity in the grave and really because we've now radiocarbon dated it. The other thing that's interesting about this burial is that the kist was partly filled with sand brought from a river about a third of a mile away. Covering bodies like this with sand was actually quite rare um, in the earlier burials in these kists. They seem to have been deliberately placed in a void and left open. And I think this might be to do with the possibility of accessing the remains. And as I'm going to talk quite a bit about um, whether these are really burials in the sense that we might mean them, um, or whether they are deliberately being placed um, under conditions and in forms of architecture that allow them to be accessed again. Okay, um, these kiss burials then didn't seem to aggregate into cemeteries before about 2150 BC. But there is one case which I think is quite interesting where you've got a local landscape where there are a series of burials that are fairly nearby. They've each got their own um, burial cairn rather than being a cemetery then united by a single cairn, which is something we see a lot more of later. And this is at Rayhoof and Roseborough Moor. Three cairns here, um, Rayhoof ones to three, one to three. They're orient they are arranged in a, a row uh, 150 metres uh, long, across the dome of a hill, near a ridge which is marked with three uh, sets of cup marked rocks. Now these and two other nearby sites include um, Rehu uh, 4 and Roseborough Moor 1, uh, included central kists. Three of them had these um, early-ish short-necked beakers. Um, and two of them were positioned so the body would have observed the ridge. The four cans are substanti substantial. The smallest is 15 metres in diameter and three metres high. In many ways, the burials on this hill seem no different from those of contemporary, isolated and seemingly unmarked kiss burials. But they do form part of a different strategy in how place is, is created and how um, a local community of the dead is made manifest in the landscape. So again, there are little variations within the region and, and distinctively um, different ways that, la that landscapes develop. Now, some of the burials from this period included other grave goods than beakers, um, bronze daggers, for instance. And all the burials that we um, have been able to identify with bronze daggers um, are adult and male. These burials seldom included a beaker and not all of them were buried on their left, so they don't all fit um, the sort of broader pattern for other male burials. Kiss location and orientation and body positioning was often diverse. Ironically though, um, that diversity might be part of a pattern because this, um, the way that burials with daggers were um, in other regions, including Eastern Scotland were placed, also tends to vary from whatever is the, the predominant picture in that region. Now, some of these burials with daggers were not buried as intact crouched bodies or were disturbed by later activity. And it's difficult to say which. At Alawash here, the pelvis and legs of what was probably a man, it was originally reported as probably a woman, but um, Michelle's analysis suggests it's probably a man, were deposited on a bed of rushes and a, a, a dagger and a lump of coal placed beside them. The lack of smaller bones hints at exposure or curation of remains before burial. 
some of the disturbed bones of a man buried with a bronze, bronze blade at Reaver Hill were scorched by fire. And this is something um, that I'll come back to. But it might not be right to think about these simply as burials left to rest in peace, um, or to think of Kiss just as graves rather than, say, something like shrines. Another thing that is relevant here in, in looking at daggers is different networks of exchange, different um, uh, spheres in which artifacts are circulated in the region. On the left here, we've got a map that shows the distribution of graves with daggers. And you can see that it's quite heavily focused on East and Central Scotland. And the Northeast is, 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 is sort of connected with that. But we don't see those um, artifacts down in, in County Durham and in the southern parts of the region. And by contrast, what we tend to find, um, sorry, and um, that overlaps with the presence of um, uh, the presence of, of, of jet, which I'll come to in a moment. The bronze that is being uh, used to make these objects most likely comes from uh, Ross Island in southwest Ireland and is then transported up probably via northeastern Scotland and then down the east coast. Now we're not certain that there aren't other local sources that were being used but most of most of the uh, metal in this period tends to be um, uh, for, coming from that direction and to that extent we're talking about exotic and perhaps prestigious objects but also about something that is uh, a media of long distance communication. Jet is another exotic material which is widespread and um, uh, across northern Britain and which turns up in these graves from around 250 BC. It was obtained from Whitby in Yorkshire, about 150 kilometres south. It's not found in any of the burials in County Durham, which is nearer to the source. And although there are not many burials down there, so that may be part of the, of the reason, it's interesting in comparison with that distribution of copper um, and with flint knives, which do tend to, to occur uh, across County Durham. Burials oriented north to south rather than east to west also cluster in this same part of northern Northumberland as where we find quite a lot of the jet. And that's interesting because north-south burial is also quite common um, uh, after around 2200 in eastern Yorkshire. So again, we might be talking about long distance connections um, and perhaps connections with people who aren't your nearest neighbour but are um, more distant than that. And it's also worth saying in this context that again different landscapes develop differently and this part of the um, of the Cheviot fringe here what we find is that there are relatively few early uh, single burials. The ones that we find there um, rarely tend to follow that gendered pattern or um, east-west burial. Um, one that does uh, or one that, that uh, is um, oriented towards the east is a burial of a man at Wooler uh, accompanied by a jet button. Now in this area then burials adopted the architecture that had been widely used elsewhere across the region with beaker pottery but buried the dead with other media instead and at the time they're doing this in most other parts of the northeast burials are starting to aggregate into small cemeteries. Um, so we find uh, sites like this, uh, this is Seafield Farm, where we've got multiple kists within now a short, uh, a short area um, of one another. And as you can see, the variation, uh, the orientation of the kist varies quite a lot, um, even within those sites, and perhaps has more to do with relationships between specific burials than obeying some kind of general pattern. We also find that some of these sites are um, uh, sites where they combine uh, different kinds of material culture. So um, a burial might, uh, one burial might have a beaker, another burial might have uh, a food vessel, this new type of pottery. I just wanna have a look at one site uh, in quite some detail because it's, um, it's been recently excavated and we've got good information about it. 
Low Hawksley uh, in Druridge Bay give us a good indication of this sequence of cemetery development. Now, um, Low Hawksley was um, eroding into the sea over the last few decades uh, until uh, students from Newcastle University and I helped Clive Waddington and a team of professionals and volunteers excavate the rest of it in 2013. The earliest dated burial here is this one, um, we think uh, in the center of a teenage boy. And he is buried with this tall form of short necked beaker. Um, and there are other burials with beakers like this in Eastern Scotland, um, which, uh, which are also um, sort of teenage, uh, teenage burials. So there's a possibility again, that it's not just sex that's marked up in distinctive ways in these burials, but it might also relate to things like age. Um, I've already mentioned the unusual burial in the second kiss, which is this one here with cremated remains. Unfortunately, we don't have a date from that, but, but um, I suspect that it is quite similar in date to this one. Then there's this third burial down here, which has got a slightly uh, later date, um, several generations later. Um, there's no vessel in this um, burial and the, the orientation is different from what we would expect um, with most of the beaker burials in the region. But only once these three burials have all been placed in the burial ground together is the area covered with uh, a cairn. And this dark area here is a curbstones that would have gone all the way around originally and, in, and um, then were then infilled with these larger stones. And here's that as a, as a photograph. So you can see the uh, half the site's already been eroded away. This is this higher rounder can in the middle. That's the that's the primary uh, curb and primary can covering those three burials um, and possibly others. And then there's a, a later addition. But, and this is part of something we start to see the way people um, increasingly return to ancient sites and rework them and bury the recently dead within there too. And so what happens next is that people who are using um, these new styles of pottery, food vessel pottery, like, like these pots, um, they're sort of coarser uh, and bulkier and, and different shapes to the, to the beaker pots. They are um, then reusing the site. And this area here is particularly interesting because it's got a kist, which probably originally contained a burial with one of these vessels. And the whole thing is then disturbed and rifled and then repaired and then later on, um, there is a, a further addition, um, restoring a complete curb to the outside. So again, here's how that looks as a photograph. There's the kist I'm going to talk about now. Um, there's the primary uh, curb, which would originally have come around here and has then been disturbed. And then we've got an addition here and then the later addition around the outside. And this is that kist as it was being excavated. And you can see that the cover slab has collapsed in and one of the side slabs is missing. And it's been pulled all the way over here. And the kist was rifled, only three bones remained in it. And there was a scatter of pottery of pot sherds out the back here. So what we can see here is um, a sort of developing sporadic tradition of burial at these sites where people are going back um, revisiting the dead sometimes, even removing the remains of the dead um, at the same time as, as using them as burial grounds. Um, I just want to give one other example of this process of sporadic cemetery development. This is a round mound at Hasting Hill uh, in Sunderland and it was excavated in 1912. And when it was excavated, two of the kists this one here and this one over here were removed um, uh, apparently uh, intact and taken and um, reconstructed along with the bones in Sunderland Museum. In re-examining the remains in the kists, we found a number of interesting things. Michelle Gamble, again, was the, was the osteologist looking at these remains and she found that um, the 40 to 55 year old man that you see in this photograph as, as, as the sort of uh, intact crouched burial was not alone in that grave. It wasn't just accompanied by this unusual style of beaker, which has got some, some food vessel decorative traits on it. 
but he was also um, accompanied by um, cremated remains of a child, um, weathered remains of at least um, one adult, and some, some teeth and, and possibly other remains from a further adult. And we've subsequently had um, the, the, the adult, the male individual, and also the teeth um, radiocarbon dated and analysed for ancient DNA. And we can tell that the, the loose teeth in this grave, or at least the one that was dated, um, dates to quite early in the period, uh, 2464 to 2208 BC. And this burial, however, this individual, he died much later, between 2194 and 1977 BC. So it looks as though the kist was reused and the original remains were pulled out. Now, there are other possibilities. These could be curated remains, or there could have been some commingling of remains from across the site. But it nonetheless appears quite likely um, that we've got a, um, a burial ground here with quite a, that is over, in use over quite a long period of time. And we've got features that are reused during that time period. Another thing that's interesting about this burial is that he's not just placed in that um, flexed or cramped position, but he's also got, as you can see here, his hands in front of his face. And the excavators describe the way that his fingers are spread over his face. And the same body positioning is also described for two other burials, um, which are likely later uh, than, this, than this first grave here. So there seems to be a tradition at the site um, in which the dead are being related to one another through that shared practice. <laughs> Okay, so it's interesting that two of the really well-preserved sites with good conditions for bone preservation give us a glimpse into some quite complex mortuary activities that might otherwise not be apparent. Now, short kists were also used to bury cremated remains, um, sometimes with a food vessel, sometimes without um, a vessel at all. And this practice of cremation uh, goes on over quite a long period of time after around, say, 2100, 2200, um, right the way through the early Bronze Age. And over time, the use of kists declines. They get smaller. Eventually, we just see stone lined pits and then the um, uh, often with vessels and then the cremated remains in there. But sometimes eventually cremated remains deposited at pre-existing sites at these mounds and cairns. Um, without any material culture and um, without any kind of formal architecture to it. And we've seen examples of that at both at Low Hawksley um, and also uh, you can see it also at Hastings Hill where they're, they're largely focused on the southern area of the site. In other cases we see cremated remains and particularly um, in the later part of the period, so after 2000 BC, we find them buried in urns, uh, in pits, uh, like the, the example of Berkside fell on the left here, or inverted um, in at rock outcrops or in um, rock shelters, uh, as in the example on the right uh, there, which I think is uh, from Goat's Crag. Um, multiple cremations are also fairly common. That is um, a vessel with more than one, the remains of more than one individual in it. It's the case at Berkside fell here and that there are various reasons why this might be. Um, if you just get one or two scraps of a second individual, it might be reusing a pyre site. Um, if there are more balanced remains, then it might be that the individuals died and were cremated together, or it might be that the vessel was used to store one individual um, for a, a period of time until the second individual dies uh, and then their remains are combined. And it, only at that point is the, is the vessel then buried. But again, it raises questions about the relationship between funerals and burial. Like what, what is burial achieving, as it were, in this period? I'll come back to that. And um, another trend in the later part of this period is to reuse older sites, sites which um, are often early Bronze Age in date, but some of which might have earlier um, uh, Neolithic activity at them or be reminiscent of Neolithic sites. So on the left here, we've got two examples of Henge monuments where we've got early Bronze Age burials um, at the centre of them. And these, these are all after uh, 1900 BC. And on the right, we've got um, uh, um, the, the lower one, really, we've got a, 
uh, at Chatton Sandiford, a series of burials with late styles of beakers uh, in the center of, a, of an already existing circular monument. And that, that sort of connection with past places is something I'm gonna talk more about later. I also want to think a little bit now about um, barrows and the, the sort of presence of these sites in the broader landscape. In the south of England, linear groups of barrow, barrows are quite well known and some dating to the earlier second millennium, so it's after 2000 BC, form straight lines lined on um, the points in the horizon where the sun rises or sets during the solstices. By contrast, in the northeast, groups of mounds are relatively rare, and so far, none have been identified as aligned on solstice events. Um, what we tend to see is groups of mounds like uh, these four at Newbra that are sort of in harmony with the landscape. They're, they are placed in almost sinuous arrangements that match the contours. Um, this is a, a, a view shed diagram. So the, the, the mound in green is the sort of origin point. And imagine standing there and looking out, you can see everything that's in white, but not the bits that are in gray. And it's quite interesting because it, it means that you, you can't see most of the course of the river um, that is below it. Um, until you get to, to over here. Um, so they aren't necessarily overlooking waterways as such, but they are, they are sort of following the contours of the landscape. Um, in some cases, what looks like a group of four or five mounds might be better understood as um, groups of pairs of mounds. And it, it is for quite rare really for when you've got three or more for them to be placed in a single row. It's almost as though they tend to avoid it. But there is one site that really intrigues me, and I've been talking to Paul um, Frodsham a bit about this, um, and it would be very interesting to see some field work here, I think. Um, this is the five barrows on Holystone Common. There are more than five barrows. Um, there are at least 14, and by some accounts, a lot more. Um, one of them is situated on a cup and ring marked ring mark um, outcrop. Excavation of two mounds on the common in the 19th century revealed food vessel pottery, cremated remains and collared urns. And these are likely to post date uh, 2000 BC. Now I'm wary of looking for lines in the landscape, but there are two intersecting paths here that I think are particularly intriguing. Um, the yellow lines that I've put onto this map, they are at the angle of the solstice sunrise um, and sunset in midwinter and midsummer. So um, we've got the northeast here, which is the midsummer sunrise. We've got the southeast here, the midwinter sunrise. And then we've got the midwinter sunset at the southwest um, and the midsummer sunset in the northwest. And you can see that some, but certainly not all of those barrows um, may be arranged around paths that might stretch off in those directions. Um, so I think survey and excavation would be really interesting to see whether there's anything to this or not um, and, and sort of get a sense of how many other mounds there are out there that perhaps don't fit this pattern at all. So for now it's just a, it's just a query rather than a statement but I think it is uh, interesting and it, if nothing else it underscores variability in um, the way that, that uh, we get aggregation of mounds across the different landscapes in the northeast is mostly quite rare, but Coquitdale is slightly different. And another thing, um, something that, that Paul Frodsham put me onto is this quite intriguing rock um, on Beacon Hill, which um, overlooks Lordenshaw um, on, on a terrace. And it is also um, oriented so that this hole that is bored through uh, a 1.7 meter thick rock um, is aligned on um, the mid midsummer sunrise and the midwinter sunset. And in the other direction from the one that is, um, the photographer is facing here, that line would connect you up with the promontory where King Edward's Priory now stands at the mouth of the Tyne, 44 kilometers away. And you can see the sea um, um, when you're stood here. I got out there about the day before uh, lockdown. Okay, now, and that, that makes me wonder again about whether there's something interesting going on in Coquitdale that we haven't quite yet um, quite, quite yet got to grips with. Okay, so um, what I want to do with the, uh, the next sort of 15 minutes or so is talk about 
what we can infer about beliefs, and then for the last 10 minutes or so, what we can talk, say about identity. Um, a key question here is what burying the dead actually achieves. Um, this need not be the same thing over the thousand year uh, period of the early Bronze Age. The dead go through a process of transformation, a rite of passage from life through death to another status. And typically this starts by celebrating their lived identity and mourning their passing. And it's followed by a process of separation from the living. And finally, the assumption of a new identity among a community of the dead. That might be in an afterlife, or it might be amongst a community of ancestors um, at the burial site, for instance. Burial is one way of enacting that point of separation and denoting that the dead and that those who mourn their passing are moving on. And it certainly seems likely that bodies buried in kits in this period were buried at this point of separation. But there are signs that this was not a simple process, and that some burials had a complicated afterlife. Burial could also serve the function of locating the dead alongside other dead people, of forming a literal community of the dead. As we've seen, that was rare early in the period and more common later. Cremated remains um, were also buried after that very tra dramatic transformation of the body. And of course, these could have been scattered rather than buried at all. So we need to think quite carefully about what these burials actually are and what they do. Kists formed enduring heavy containers for the dead. And some burials were successively contained, um, as in the case of the one that was buried in this log coffin <coughs> at, Carting at Cartington, and was probably also wrapped in, um, uh, in, in a soft outfit. The dead were generally tightly confined within their kists and kept in place with a heavy cover slab. When they were placed in the kist, early on in the period, the dead were physically directed towards an experience that was shared facing south or southeast and also divided along gendered lines. This suggests a cosmology which presented male and female principles as mutual and complementary. Men and women shared the destiny after death. In this part of Britain, the sun always passes through the southern half of the sky, even in the middle of winter. Ahead of most of the buried dead lay light and warmth, therefore, as they faced south. Laying the dead in a consistent position like this implies that it was seen as auspicious and proper, part of a moral and emotive code of conduct. Now, it's worth noting that not everyone was buried according to this pattern, and that it broke down over time, perhaps as beliefs changed. Now, once a body was placed in a kist, further objects were introduced. Um, these might be things that connected the living with the dead, their memories and experiences of one another, but the things that have survived do not seem to have been particularly individualistic choices. We don't find sort of whole collections of things that might have been people's personal artifacts. They're more stereotypically associated with certain social roles and obligations, and they potentially say more about the ethos of these burials, about the ideas that were important for the community to reflect on when they buried the dead. By far the, by far the most common grave goods are pots. In Northeast Scotland, Alexandra Shepherd has identified differences in vessel design for beakers buried with men and with women. So some intimate connection between the vessels chosen and the bodies of the dead is possible. Placing beakers and or food vessels in the grave provided the dead with a way to give and receive food, to cook and to feed. Any food included might sustain them <coughs> with tastes and smells that would remind them of their home life. And this might even be important in ensuring that their spirits did not attempt to return home. This is something that's been suggested for the inclusion of um, half, half debris in medieval graves, for instance. Interestingly, bronze axe heads were never buried with the dead and arrowheads were only present in four of, of these inhumations. People hunted and probably fought with and carried axes and bows and arrows, but unlike some other regions of Northern and Central Europe, it seems there was less emphasis on a hunting or warrior identity in the burials. Axe heads have been found as straight finds locally, so we know that they were available. Perhaps these objects accompanied some of the dead during the early stages of a funeral, but as the living and dead were separated, stayed amongst the living. Perhaps the dead didn't need arrows or axes, or perhaps these were retained by the living as a way to remember the dead. Um, or perhaps they were deposited away from a grave, or perhaps axes were melted down and recast. 
Now, by contrast, daggers were provided for some of the dead. These might have been everyday tools, or they might have been drawn only in specific situations, such as defending slights against, uh, against slights of honour. We just don't know. They could be used to kill animals, particularly by slicing the neck, and to cut meat for sharing, an emblem of living and eating well, perhaps. Blades might have featured in rituals, including rites of passage associated with birth, such as cutting the umbilical cord, or initiation, perhaps through shaving or scarification, or in making sacrifices. Placing a knife with the dead, usually a man, might provide the means for him to share with others in his new existence, or to defend himself or the living. But knives could also have been chosen to cut the dead away from the living in a rite of separation at the graveside. Um, and that could have happened sometime after death, uh, too, if, if, um, if it was felt necessary. Some deposits of cremated remains also included an unburnt flint knife blade placed on top of the remains. And I wonder if this was a, um, an equivalent, a symbolic act of cutting away the dead. But the dead were not always left to rest in peace after they died. The important recent work by Tom Booth and others has detected a number of burials from this period where bodily decay was arrested before microbes could attack the bones. This suggests some preservation of bodies and raises the question of how long bodies were retained between death and burial, whether they were kept rather than buried in kists, whether kists might intended to be reopened and remains temporarily removed and displayed and then later returned. Now, as I mentioned, earlier kists were less commonly backfilled with soil than later ones. And it suggests to me that there are changes in this idea in, in the, um, the accessibility of the dead and the extent to which the transformation needs to be made visible. Successive burial adds to this possibility. Um, for instance, this is a site at, at Dower Hill. Um, the enormous cover slab here was removed um, and a second child was placed into a grave that already contained uh, one child. Kists like this were also the scene of fires. You can see some burnt patches here. Um, and in some cases, we know that this happened before the mound was constructed. Um, that can be seen, for instance, in an example from Brandon in County Durham, where burning um, scorched the kist, scorched the stones and scorched the human remains within. And Michelle's analysis of some of the human remains uh, in uh, the Great North Museum, as at this one at West Warmly, suggests that these were um, scorched and exposed to high temperatures uh, in the kists. So there may have been extended funerary sequences, perhaps monitoring the decaying remains, perhaps in some cases purifying them further by setting fire to them. I think that we can see these buried remains as the focus of complex and perhaps long-term processes of personal transformation and commemoration, rather than just rapid remains from single stage funerals. Okay, and just to, to bring this to a close, what I want to do now is, is to talk about identity. And again, I'm relating this um, to uh, beliefs about identity. Um, I think this is important because it tells us something about what people believed about themselves, about their origins and about their place in the world. Um, now, interpretations of cultural identity in this period have often been dominated by discussion of whether or not there was a beaker people. And I think this tends to skew our view of what was important to people at the time. As we heard last week, and we saw a version of this, um, of this image in Andrew's talk, recent ancient DNA analyses clearly show that people in these burials had a much larger proportion of their genetic ancestry that is similar to contemporaneous burials in Holland than it is to Neolithic burials from Britain. We know that both men and women with non-local ancestry were involved in this process, but this was not a single event migration, and even referring to it as a single process oversimplifies things. This image actually tracks the progress um, of this over time. So um, on the left here, um, in, the, in the, the blown up version at the bottom, in the left here, those last two that are fully blue, those are um, Neolithic. And then the, the, the red, if you like, shows the relationship to these Dutch burials, the similarity with them anyway, and the blue is similarity with um, Neolithic burials from Britain. And what you can see is that over time, there are some high peaks, and then things start to average out a bit, around 12% uh, 
um, uh, after about 2150 BC. So this is contemporary with um, those changes that I was talking about in different styles of burial practice, diversification in practice. Um, so the early period is very varied with some individuals with no local ancestry, um, all in red, and others with about 30 or 40%. <clears throat> but after 2150 BC, there is less variation. A process has occurred by which this ancestry has um, averaged out by this time. This suggests greater interbreeding with those um, um, with, high, with those with higher levels of local ancestry over time, particularly after and around 2150 BC, when burials became more common and more diverse. Those living after 2150 BC who buried their dead in variations on ways that had been introduced in the Chalcolithic with the earliest beaker burials had some biological ancestors who'd lived in Britain in the Neolithic, but more biological ancestors who had lived elsewhere. But while the DNA tells us about this biological ancestry, it does not tell us about what kinds of ancestral connections were important to these people. It's only one part of a much larger story about cultural identity. For one thing, cremated remains cannot at present be analyzed for ancient DNA, meaning that we only have a part of the picture. I want to focus now on what else was going on in terms of material culture and monuments. The genetic averaging after around 2200 BC coincides with a period of interregional connections, which we can see in the movement of things like the bronze and the jet we've already talked about, and the spread of food vessel pottery styles across Northern Britain. And it is also contemporary with a renewed interest in now ancient sites. As we saw from Paul and Kate's talk a few weeks ago, <coughs> that included quarrying rock art panels and using those slabs in building uh, kists or cairns. It also involved the reuse of burial grounds that were out of use for over 150 years and sometimes, um, uh, sorry, um, and uh, cemeteries that accumulated around earlier beaker burials as we saw at Low Hawksley. Alex Gibson has even suggested that food vessels emulated middle Neolithic impressed wares like the one on the right here. Um, cremation prior to burial, prevalent in the later Neolithic, but rare in the Beaker period, also resurfaced around 2150 BC. It's possible that there were some attempts here to revive features of Neolithic practice and an appeal to the distant past, but I'm very wary of interpreting this um, simply in terms of a resurgence of indigenous concerns and traditions, as Gibson puts it. I'm going to suggest instead that there were several complex processes of cultural fusion in which diverse pasts were drawn together. Firstly, as we've already seen, the appearance of beaker pottery and burial practices was patchy and locally varied. So there were multiple traditions amongst any newcomers and multiple local identities as well. Furthermore, Many early beaker burials in the south of Britain were located near to massive Neolithic monument complexes like Stonehenge, indicating an interest <coughs> in distinctive local monu Neolithic monuments from the outset of the period. There were also locally diverse megalithic constructions, which arguably fused together different ideas seen in the Neolithic in new ways. So on the left here, we've got um, um, images from um, Adam Welfare's excellent book on recumbent stone circles in Aberdeenshire. And um, these are new constructions in this period um, that are, um, have a Southwest alignment to them, um, almost like earlier, um, well, later Neolithic passage graves um, in uh, the very far North of, of Scotland um, and in uh, parts of Ireland. And, on the right here from Richard Bradley's work in um, uh, the Clava Cairns, uh, ju just over um, from Aberdeenshire, you can see again the same alignment. And these again are now known to be early Bronze Age rather than Neolithic construction. So there's a return to and a continuation of some practices that were important in the Neolithic. Um, Early Bronze Age artifacts and motifs also draw on many different traditions. Some of them are local, but some of them are more distant in origin. For instance, crescentic jet necklaces like the one on the right, many of which were made from Whitby jet, drew on the designs um, present in Irish gold lunuli and which were not found in Britain. Sunburst and cross in circle motifs on the base of food vessels like this one uh, from Harbottle Peels at Alwinton 
have a very long heritage too. They can be found on um, early beaker pottery in Ireland, for instance, and they can also be found um, in continental um, uh, bell beaker pottery and even in copper discs like the one on the right here, buried in much earlier burials, <coughs> even as early as 2800 BC in Central and Eastern Europe. The perforated jet buttons, like the one on the left here, which is from Lilburn uh, Southsteads, um, also have their ancestry in these same um, artifacts from the continent. Even though they were made in different materials. Now this again suggests some continued connections or the repeated translation of meaningful symbols into new media over many centuries. And this carried over into the use of, of food vessels and artifacts associated with them. It's not clear how much of the origin of these symbols was known centuries later, but it does show more than a simple interest in the local and indigenous past. Rather, I think, it's a cultural fusion. And to give a final example, where there are perforated middle Neolithic maces from Britain, um, early Bronze Age axe hammers and some battle axes seem similar to Northeast European hammer axes, battle axes, which again have third millennium continental um, antecedents. And finally, due to the excellent work of the Beaker People Project, we also know there was a high degree of interregional mobility. And this has been deduced by looking at, at bone chemistry um, and relating it to geology in life um, and, and uh, sort of at different stages in the life course. I think that the averaging out of genetic ancestries was likely the long-term result of centuries of longer distance and, sh and shorter distance mobility and interaction for a range of reasons, including trade, exchange, herding animals, visiting sacred places, seeking the allure of the exotic and bringing home the kudos associated with travel, relocation during marriage and keeping in touch with kin. I would therefore infer a complex process of cultural fusion throughout the late third millennium. And I suspect it was probably a series of different processes in which local and regional identities were repeatedly negotiated. People um, changed and adapted their beliefs about who they were and where they came from. This continued into the early second millennium, though there are some important regional variations. For instance, the South of England had very close continental ties by this time. Okay, so to conclude, to sum up the state of play for Northeast England, isolated burials in the centuries around 2200 BC tended to present the dead in an idealized way, um, postures that varied by age and sex. But this varied more than in some of the other neighboring, neighboring regions. The dead joined a widely dispersed community, uni united only at the large scale by these shared practices, by media like short kists and short neck beakers. This might imply some shared beliefs over a very large area. But there are also local variations and some landscapes in which burial was rare. After 2150 BC, burials began to accumulate into larger cemeteries across much of the region. The increasing incidence of graves being backfilled or burnt prior to mound construction may also suggest an increasing desire to further transform the dead in the grave the soil hastening decay, the fire cleaning the bones. <clears throat> some kists were disturbed and some burial grounds were reconfigured. Burial increasingly placed the dead into a local community of the ancestral dead, a community that included more children and more women than before. In some cases, as at Hastening Hill, body position referred more to previous burials at the same site than it did to a, a, a broad category of people, such as men or women. Cremation before deposition increased throughout the whole region, as it did across much of Northern Europe after 2000 BC. Cairns and barrows became redolent not only of death or loss or markers of people who'd achieved some special renown, but the growth of a shared ancestral community. After around 2000 BC in Coquitdale, perhaps some of these rows of mounds were aligned on the rising and setting sun at key moments in the year. But by this time, Burial mounds were a common sight, spotted on a journey home into the hills, places where cremations might be scattered or offerings made, perhaps places where people claimed their ancestors lay. By the end of the period, cremated remains were inserted into the mounds of, these long, um, of those long dead, who were probably now little more than anonymous ancestors. 
And all of these changes took place as part of local negotiations of identity, which knitted together many different media, symbols and histories with disparate origins and engaged in new ways with the remains of the distant past in the local landscape. Thank you for listening. Trying to get, <clears throat> trying to get myself back, <laughs> come back. There I am. Um, thanks, Chris. That's great. Really interesting. So many things. So many things. I knew there was going to be a lot to think about in 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 um, in one lecture. Can I can I just say there was an interesting comment from um, John Errington, um, who said he has a small uh, funerary cup from um, Cholerford. Um, I don't know if you're there, John, I don't know whether you, when you say you have it, whether you have it with you at the moment, um, if so, perhaps you could unmute yourself and bring it to the screen and, and show it to us and we can have a chat about it. I, I think I know from your description the kind of thing you're talking about. Um, if, that, if that's possible, maybe you could do that, please, rather than just talk about it without seeing it. Um, yeah. While you do that. What was that? Yep. Uh, oh, are you there? Then we just got to try and find you now. I knew I shouldn't have said this. <laughs> you no video at the moment. Ah. There we are. Ah, there we are. There you are. Right. Um, oh, yeah. Ah, yeah. Well, yes, that's that's kind of what I expected. Can you can you see that, Chris? Yeah, very nice. Yeah. Do you want to say anything about that? Do you want to um, tell us where it came from, John, first of all? Sorry? Do you want to tell us where it came from? Yes. Um, it, it was given to me by a farmer at Cholliford when I was working on a farm. Did you, did you hear that all right? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I, was, I was working on a farm in the 1950s and the at the time, they were doing excavations on the Roman wall, which runs through the same area. And the farmer knew I was interested in the excavations. And he just produced this from his pocket and said, if you like these old things, you'll probably like this. So I assumed it was, uh, it was from the Roman excavations. And it was right. only about two years ago, there was somebody from Bradford University doing a talk oh. on Beaker, uh, people and uh, I uh, it clicked with me that what I had actually was a beaker um, ornament and uh, it's been to Bradford University and they, they've agreed it's it's an early beaker uh, from an inhumation it has it has a scorch mark on it so it's probably yeah. associated yeah. with a cremation I think yeah they're more yeah. they are more more commonly with cremations and they're, they're usually associated with um collard urns which are slightly later so yeah it would normally be sort of around 2000 bc um That's, yeah can you hold it can you hold it up again yeah yeah Let's see if i can pin your picture so i can see it bigger no it's very small it is. It's, it's very well decorated, though, isn't it? It's quite evenly decorated. It is. There's the scorch mark, if you can see it. Yeah. It's it's in very good condition. It is. And they uh, did do, There was someone at Bradford who was doing a study, well, it was quite a few years ago now, um, looking at contents, trying to work out the whether they had, um, working out what the contents were by doing lipid analysis and chemical residue analysis. Right. But they found that most of them didn't really have anything in them. They don't seem to have been used for um, for very long um, before they were uh, placed in, in the, on the pyre with the, with the dead or placed into the, the graves with the remains. But it should definitely, yeah, it's good if you, to have it recorded. Yeah, it, it's... But it's, it's a little what, what will get called an accessory vessel, isn't it? Yeah. Right. Um, or pygmy cup in the olden days. Yeah, they've, they've got various yeah. names, haven't they? Pig, pygmy yeah. cups, accessory vessels. Yeah, uh, right. It doesn't seem to be perforated. Some of them were some of them were, were called incense cups, and the idea was that you burnt something in them and they had little holes in that, that it would come out through, but yeah. it doesn't look like it's one of those. This, this one actually has a thumbprint in the bottom, would you believe? 
Oh, that's nice. Isn't that brilliant? Yeah. It looks it, perfect. Yeah, it almost it is. Looks, looks chip out amazing. of the rim. And that's all. Yeah. And um, but uh, sadly, I can't give you any context. You know, and I know the farm that the the farmer works on, but there's no no burial site marked on the farm. And all he said was, "I found it among some tree roots a few years ago when a, a tree was uprooted." So there, mu right. there must be a burial up there. But uh, sadly, yeah, there, there are there are a lot round there. If if you could send me um if you could send me the name of the farm, then I can work out a grid reference, and then I can sort of, you know generally, and then we could could see how close it is to other burials in that in that area. But there are others there. Yeah. Okay. Right. We'll see if we can find out some more about it for you, John. But thank you for uh, mentioning that. That's uh, that's very interesting. It's not every time we do one of these talks and somebody comes up with an original <laughs> little um, uh, early Bronze Age vessel of some kind. It's a real find, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, just going back to some questions then. We've got a few questions. I can't be sure whether there's still any more coming in. I'm trying to look at that at the same time. Um, so um, somebody asked, when you were talking about um, Jet, do you think Whitby Jet um is is linked or might be linked in some way to death or mourning like in victorian times um it's it's i suppose it's possible but i i, I think it's very difficult to get a handle on that um one of the things uh, jet, jet is jet is really interesting you find that it is it's being used for very specific types of artifacts so it's used for buttons it's used for um beads and necklaces it's used for certain kinds of, of, of rings. We're not really sure what they're used for, but um, maybe to do with sort of um, folding belts and things like this. Um, and there are certain sorts of artifacts that don't seem to be made from jet. So for instance, um, dagger pommels, they tend to be made from light materials. Um, but the necklaces that are made from jet, those crescent necklaces in particular, you can find them in other materials. So there are some um, in bone, there are some in amber. So I, I don't think that there's necessarily an exclusive relationship between jet and um, the necklaces. And I'm, I'm, I don't think they're necessarily to do with death and mourning because they could be worn in a range of different contexts and we don't really know what those are. Um, but we, we do know that in at least some cases, people are wearing them to the grave. Yeah. Um, okay. Another another artifact question. Somebody asked when you were talking about um, the kind of things that you you find uh, in in graves. Were knives easier to make than axes? I think we're talking bronze things here. Ooh, I don't know the answer to that question, but I know lots of people who <laughs> lots of people who do. I suspect I suspect there's not much in it. Um, if anything, it might be more difficult because the, the axe shape is really quite homogenous, whereas the, the daggers have got lots of sort of complicated bits in them, like um, rivet holes and tangs and, and so on. So um, I don't think so. I think it's more likely that, um, that the dagger blades would be easier to cast. I don't think that's the I don't think that would be the reason why they're not in the graves. I think it must well, be it must be a deliberate choice. Yeah, I, I think that was the gist of the question. Um, um, uh, Low Hawksley. Um, so, uh, by the way, people were saying uh, there's a time team about Low Hawksley, yeah. and uh, apparently it is on YouTube. So um, if people want to watch that, uh, you can see it on YouTube. I've not seen it on YouTube, but apparently it's there. So some people said so. Um, if you want more archaeology, get on YouTube and watch that um, tonight. Um, but somebody said about the burials being by the sea, and was there any significance in the burials being by the sea? Do you think? Um, possibly. I mean, there's the, again, there's um, they occur in lots of different landscape settings, but the earlier ones in particular do tend to be along the courses of, of riverways, waterways, um, and near the sea. Um, there are clusters that are on headlands uh, in particular, and we do tend to find that the, the cemeteries and the barrow groups, there are some of those in those sort of areas. It's slightly difficult to answer because the the uh, the, low, the, the, ero the coastal erosion as to how much we've lost. 
Um, but I think for the ones at, at Low Hawksley, uh, uh, I think it, it has been argued. I think, it's, I think Clive has, has argued this out in, in the volume um, that there were uh, lagoons around there and so on. These would have perhaps been islands or they would have formed a, um, a liminal place within the landscape. So it's, 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 it's possible. It's possible. Certainly riverside um, locations are quite common. But then so are, so are uh, locations kind of quite high up on hills, aren't they? Quite a long way for, away from uh, rivers. So it's difficult to, um, I suppose you could say the sea uh, or each individual site must have had some significance as to where it was that was um, significant to that site particularly perhaps. Yeah, well, I, mean, I think, I think there would be, yeah, there might be a whole series of sort of historical reasons, which would then be very difficult for us to detect. But there might also be ideas about sort of generally what are good places within the landscape. And it wouldn't necessarily be that um, that you would choose. It, it might be more the case that you would choose a landscape which had some important features to it. And that might be overlooking the sea or it might be being up on top of a, of, of a high hill or it might be being near some rock art. Or whatever that i think there, there would be lots of different factors I, I spent a fair bit of time last year trying to look at landscape location and it doesn't really fall into any really neat and clear 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 cut patterns um it probably is about that sort of idea of picking places that are locally distinctive for a whole series of reasons yeah and those can change through time of course as well can't they so that you yep yeah you know, yep. and i think they're regionally varied as well even within the northeast yeah yeah um Somebody, uh, somebody's just asked, when can we do a proper dig at Summerhill in Wrighton and find more, more kists? Well, there's lots of places where we'd like to do a proper dig, I suppose. Um, we'll add it to the list. Uh, we will do a dig somewhere. Can't say where yet. Um, do you think it was only very important people buried with artifacts and in burials rather than being burned? Um, there's kind of two different things in there rather than being burned. Mm. The key thing maybe is because people could be burned and put with objects, but do you, do you think it was very mostly very important people who were buried with artifacts? I'm quite wary of, of, of uh, interpretations about status like that because of the, of the fact that, that so much is missing. Um, it's, 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 you're always trying to compare one, one group of people with um, a, a vast number of people who aren't buried at all. So I think it's quite difficult to say. Also, you don't tend to find sites where you've got somebody buried with um, a really important object, if you like, a prestigious object like a, a jet necklace or a dagger. And then the subsequent burials at that site all have similar things. Um, you, you, you don't find sites that are just consistently rich over time, as it were. So I don't think that there is good evidence for there being a kind of hereditary hierarchical status that is perpetuated over time. It might be that people did use objects um, in order to make claims to being important, to being prestigious, to being well traveled, to being well connected, um, or, or just to, to having bling basically, but mm. it, it's, it's not necessarily the case that that translates into them being of higher status than others. Um, you know, how do you compare a burial which has got a, a dagger in it, but which is in a, a sort of very secluded riverside location and doesn't have a large mound with a burial that's on top of a hill, doesn't have any artifacts in it, or maybe just has one small beaker, but has got, a, um, you know, a, a, a 20 metre cairn around it and a, a massive views and can be seen from a long way off. So there might be lots of different ways in which people um, invested in the burial of the dead, but whether or not that means those people were of higher status than others is difficult to say. And just, just one final thing on that. It, thinking about the objects in the grave might actually be, be missing another point, which is the, the people who are often most important in society might have the most complicated funer funerary arrangements, and those might go on for a long period of time. So it's possible that we might be looking at some of the burials that have been very heavily disturbed um, and they might actually therefore have fewer objects in them uh, than some of the other burials, but they might be quite important people because it was important to go back and keep on being in contact with their remains. Mm. 
And I suppose as well, we shouldn't forget that there could have been any number of other things in the graves that don't survive. So we don't know what else is being buried with them, do we? Yeah, um, there's some there's some great examples that um, there was a, a kiss that was discovered in um, in Devon, wasn't it? At, uh, White Horse Hill, is it? And um, there was uh, all sorts of, of, of fabrics in there, for instance, that, that you just wouldn't see otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, and some of those can be quite exotic or quite fine. Yeah. Um, right, moving through, not many more to get through. Um, somebody asked, um, where were the bodies cremated prior to, be, prior to being put in a kiss? That, that was before you mentioned uh, the, the Dur Hill site. Um, but I, I, if I might just say something as well to that, when, when we excavated at Turf Now um, up in uh, the Ingram Valley, the Breamish Valley years and years ago, um, we found um, a fire pit next to a, a burial kiss and we thought, wow, we've sorted it. This, this, is, this is it. Um, we've, we've, um, we, we've got the cremation pile right next to the, um, to, to the kiss um, underneath the cairn. But uh, the date from the fire pit was Anglo-Saxon, <laughs> which to some people will be more interesting because it's implying reuse of a prehistoric burial, but it didn't help with where the Bronze Age people were being um, cremated. So, um, so the, the question, where, where do you think the bodies were cremated? Um, almost anywhere. I mean, it, it, it's, it is almost impossible to, to find something like a pyre site, really. Um, I think the turf now was, was really interesting. I, the, Jackie McKinley's reports on, on, on the remains from there were really interesting because she focused not just on the presence of the bone, but also sort of ash and other debris. And it's really difficult, actually, to identify um, a cremation deposit, as it were, because you could be spreading stuff around all over the place. What what we what you tend to see, um, I think there I think there are cases of of both burials which are of remains that have been kept for some time after cremation or carried from somewhere else, and can be quite clean, so that you don't get much charcoal in them, for instance, and other examples where you've got pits which have got an awful lot of charcoal and plank material going in with the cremated bone where it, and where the, the sides of the pits are also stained orange in a way that makes them look as though they've gone in hot. Um, there was one, I had a slide of it actually. Um, I'll just go back to this. Ah, there we go, right. So. Just um, on the left here, that battle axe from Cairn Dairy, that comes out of a, of a cremation deposit um, at um, a chamber tomb or outside a chamber tomb, outside of a chamber tomb there. And um, it came from uh, a pit that was filled with cremated bone, um, charcoal, um, at one of those little accessory vessels like John's got and um, an upside down collared urn. And, in that case, it, it looks for all the world as though someone has shoveled in um, the cremated, like the pyre, basically, along with the, the bone material. And so we imagine that it's something that took place right at hand. Um, but in other cases, like the one from Berkside Fell, where you've got it in that massive pot, um, it was it was clearly put in that pot and then brought there. But we don't know how, how much distance it travelled. Um, you, you touched on... Um the kind of uh, double cremation um, idea at one point as well, that you quite often find two cremations in one pot. Um, I, I'm quite intrigued by the number of times, and I can't statistically remember how many it is, but um, the times that you get a child and an adult cremated together. Yeah. Is that something that you've thought about at all? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it's an interesting one, because on the one hand, it does start, it does start making you think about whether this was... Um, you know, to do with some sort of parental relationship or, or sibling relationship or something like that. But on the other hand, the, just in the process of identifying multiple numbers of individuals from a set of very fragmented burnt remains, it's much easier to spot if one of them is a child. So, so, so you know, you, you can easily see if you've got a child mixed in with an adult, whereas you would miss it more often if it were two adults of, of a similar kind of, you know, robust frame, as it were. Um, now, contemporary osteologists wouldn't miss it necessarily, um, but um, a lot of the reports that we're dealing with here are, are from quite some time ago. So my suspicion yeah. is that the child-adult admixture is overrepresented and it's seen more often. 
Um, that doesn't mean to say that it's not still real and that, that there weren't cases where people combined children and adults because they did. Um, but but, wh but whether it's, it's such a majority um, as that, I don't know. Okay. Um, somebody was asking about population estimate and can we use these um, burials to estimate the population of the Northeast? Um, Mm. Yeah, again, uh, yeah, again, that depends on whether you on, on what percentage of the population you think was buried. It's almost yeah. like a, a chicken and the egg, really, isn't it? Because you, you, you've got to start somewhere in order to think about um, how you build an understanding of the demography. But if you do it from the burials, then you, you're assuming that the burials are a fair representation of the population. But they might not be. They might be very selective. They might be a quite small percentage of the population. And unfortunately, we just don't know. We don't, we don't know what percentage of the population they are. And that means it's very difficult to then make that estimate. The other ways that people have gone about doing it is to think about um, environmental impact and whether there are periods in which it looks as though there is more land clearance, um, um, more intensive agriculture going on. Um, that's not something that I've really looked into a lot. Um, but but there are, I think you've got Clive Waddington speaking at some point, haven't you? I'm sure he, he will. Uh, but yeah, he I haven't asked him yet. I haven't asked him yet. So no. All right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I hope he will. Well, well, hopefully, is, hopefully he will. He, he's, he's, done, he's done a fair bit of work on, on um, uh, looking at sort of agricultural practices and terracing and things like this. And I think he has thought about population more than I have. Yeah. Um, kind of leads me to start thinking about the end of this whole tradition as well, the end of this. Um, early Bronze Age burial tradition and, and, and where does it end and why and what comes next but maybe that's another question for another lecture. Um, this, somebody's asked uh, does the change to cremation indicate change in beliefs hastening transformation to fully dead um, and was this an indication of status given that the large quantity of wood required to cremate a body is very resource heavy? Interesting question. Yeah some good questions I mean I, I think um, about the, the, the change in belief I think it probably does but I, I'm not sure um, whether, but in a sense, what I've been trying to, to show is that I think that is part of a, of a, of a longer term process in which um, the dead have already uh, moved from just being placed in the grave and left there to then being transformed at the grave site by doing things like setting fire to kists or um, uh, removing remains or um, putting soil on them. Um, and I think cremation comes in around that time, but yes, it could well relate to um, to changing understandings about, for instance, the fate of different aspects of, of, of the person. Um, so if you're cremating the dead, you're sending, um, if you like, some, some bits of them up into the sky, you're sending them up in, you know, into the air through smoke, and then you're burying their remains um, under the ground. Whereas if you're dealing with um, an inhumation, it, it just all goes under the ground. And they, they, those could be, they could be connected to different religious ideas. Um, status, again, I go back to my previous uh, comment because it, it, it's difficult because you don't know what you're comparing it to. Um, and with cremation as well, I think we can quite readily accept the idea that a lot of people might be cremated and their remains not buried. You know, that, that they, would, they would just be scattered in the way that, that we can now um, scatter quite a lot of, of the ashes of the dead ourselves. Um, but actually the same thing could be said of inhumations. Um, that bodies could be left to decay um, at certain places in the landscape and it would be very difficult for us to see. There, um, Alex Gibson and Joanna Brook and a number of people have, have drawn together examples of cases where we can say this, um, where there, are, there are, are bodies that seem to have been exposed for some period of time before they go into these early Bronze Age graves. So there's a, a broad range of, of, of lots of lots of different things going on and they might require different levels of energy and intervention. Um, cutting down wood and burning the wood and using the, the resource that, that you do in doing that would be um, you know, somewhat costly in that sense, but then so would all these other things. Sure, um, you're getting lots of messages saying, thank you very much, very, very interesting, super, thank you very much. And someone's just said, thank you so much for answering the questions as well, very interesting, but not quite done yet, because they're still coming in. Um, was there a lot of quarrying done with tools to get the flat slabs for the kists and were most kists near local stone quarries mm. oh that's a good one yeah i don't know 
part part of the problem is again that I don't, I don't think anybody has ever really comprehensively studied it we talked about this about 10 years ago didn't we, we were trying to, to put together a project to look at stone working and quarrying and rock art all together um and i think i think that would still be a a, a good thing to do um but i i don't have a, a straightforward answer to that i would i would do is i'd refer them back to to your talk with kate actually and, and thinking about things like quarrying slabs that have got rock art on them um mm. people sort of using material that has already got historical significance to it um and I, I suppose i glossed over this in my talk a bit but there there might be different um intentions and different um attitudes involved in this you know it isn't all just a case of, of making a connection with the past in a way which is positive and appreciative it might also be sort of getting rid of it and it might also be appropriating it in a, in a way which is is, is slightly um instrumental you know so i think that um i'm not answering this question very well at all i don't know the answer i suppose is is, is probably the easiest mm -hmm. thing to say I, I i'm just reminded of turf now again where one of the kists in the round can um had had lovely pink um andesite um slabs at each end and sandstone um at each i think it was sandstone anyway different stone at each side and clearly that was a deliberate decision that people have taken different colors and types of stone to build the one kiss so in, yeah. in some cases there's definitely some thought went into the construction of these things yeah but burkside fell that that one I, I showed with the um uh the cremation in the collardern uh there that there's an arrangement where they have selected quartz blocks for the curb and put those in in various positions but there, there aren't a lot of cases that I can think of that have been re reported in the literature um, where, where there's sort of distinctive stonework used. There's only a few, I think. A lot of the time in the antiquarian excavations, though, <clears throat> they were after the yeah. treasure, weren't they? So the slabs just got thrown away. So we, we probably never know. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Oh, I was just going to say that's it. And it says one new message. It might be just someone saying night night or it might be, um, oh, no, great talk, great talk. Thank you. It would be difficult to cut along slab with primitive tools mm -hmm. uh, yeah not necessarily i mean I, I suppose what the other thing is there's going to be an awful lot of stone just kicking about in the landscape and there would be a lot um if you went to outcrops presumably there would also be quite a lot that would just have sheared off naturally um so i'm not sure that they necessarily had to quarry all of these but if you look at some of the some of the images from from the talk you will see that a lot of them have got these sort of smooth faces and squared ends and so on um, which suggests that they probably were worked in some way. Um, for, but quarrying, I think you can do it, can't you, by um, sort of putting wedges in and, and, and wetting them. And um, yeah. I think that it, it's quite possible to um, to work stone using the tools that they would have in that period. Mm -hmm. Depends on the kind of stone and all sorts of things as well. Yeah. Um, brilliant. Thank you very much. Well. Um, uh, one observation just to finish that may be of no relevance whatsoever, but um, I noticed uh, two occasions where you had crosses in your talk. One was the solstitial uh, arrangements from uh, Holy Stone, and the other one um, was the base of the food vessel. Yep. And I'd never thought about this before, but I just thought, why would you have a cross on the base of a food vessel? Mm, I wonder what that's symbolizing. Maybe it's just decorative, or maybe there's something in that. I'd never thought about that. I knew about that food vessel before, but I'd never thought about what it might represent probably rubbish uh, yeah but, you, know. uh, you could get really carried away and think about the fact that it, it's um, like these two paths with these dots either side a bit like the mounds but I, I think really that it, it it goes back to that longer history more and the fact that that motif occurs hundreds of years before this um in parts of continental Europe and then in um places like Ireland and, and in Britain so it there you can look for multiple connections and they might not you know you might not necessarily have to choose just one of them like you know yeah. they could be valid for multiple reasons well I think that's it uh, thank you very much uh, it's been hugely interesting loads of people saying so much information brilliant thank you very much um next week I'm sorry to say it's me again um solstice might get mentioned next week because um several of you have asked me will i talk to you about long meg even though it's outside our region so next week's about standing stones um i'll talk for the first half um about long meg and the second half about all the different kinds of standing stone settings uh, stone circles stone squares stone alignments standing stones um in the second half next week so hopefully um you'll um you'll all come back for that
same time next week. Okay. Um, thank you again very much, Chris, yep. and thank you all for being here. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Are you there to switch us off, David? Yes. No, I've got nothing to say for once. So. <laughs> Are you still still going to turn to prehistory now? I don't know. You got me excited when he said crosses, and then, you know, it's a long, long date. So. <laughs> uh, uh, early medieval burning. When he talked to you about the early medieval burning, wherever that was, <laughs> that sounds exciting. So. Right. It's all just the long early medieval. Right. Yes. <laughs> or later prehistory. All right. Cheers. I'll, I'll keep an eye out for some uh, for the emails about the um, the other talks. So hopefully, I'll see you soon. Yeah. Okay. Lovely. Thank you so much again, Chris. Thank Bye. you all. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.